Charlie, I turn it over to you. Okay. Hello, hello. Amazing. I, I don't think I've ever spoken where there's a crane. That is unbelievably cool. And of course, uh, you know, when you speak at a conference about complex technologies, of course, the old technologies are extremely janky. So I often get my podcast is often criticized because we uh, recorded on Zoom and uh, we get all sorts of comments like, how can three tech guys have a podcast about VR and AI and their sound sucks? What the hell? Not very good for your authority. So um, our, our, our panel, uh, Machine Learning Retrospective, where we've come and where we're going, uh, is a rather big and broad topic. So I, I think we're going to bounce around a little bit. Um, we didn't do big introductions here, um, but starting uh, on the end, uh, why, don't, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about your current job, um, how you came to specialize um, in this technology, and uh, how you work with it every day. So let's just, as a way sure. of breaking the ice. Absolutely. And First of all, apologies for not being Jessica Hawk, who was supposed to be here from, from Microsoft, from our data and AI team. Uh, but I'm Andy Beach. I'm our chief technology officer for media and entertainment at Microsoft, looking after our tech strategy. So uh, I look after tech strategy, look at the ISV space, and who are the right partners, and then what are the right use cases, and what are the right AI scenarios that we need to be working on and focusing to make sense for you guys as, as customers. I'm Rick Randy. I work at NVIDIA. Um, I was a visual effects artist and developer for 25 or so years and started dabbling in AI um, and uh, got an offer from NVIDIA and I've been here about six years now. And I think the greatest thing about it is if you're curious about what is possible, it is just a great field to jump into. Hey everyone, oh, my name is uh, Bilabal Sidhu. I'm an AI creator. Uh, I make entertaining and educational content for over a million subscribers across YouTube, TikTok, and increasingly uh, Twitter or X. Uh, saying you're an X creator is still a little bit weird, so thanks, Elon. Uh, prior to that, I spent a decade in tech, uh, predominantly at Google or as a product manager, and I worked on immersive capture, AR, VR platform, and geospatial 3D mapping. Uh, got into visual effects and all this cool stuff, reality bending stuff uh, at the age of 11, making really awful uh, Star Wars fan films. And so I feel that same level of excitement today with this rise of generative AI and great to be here. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Charlotte Nelson. I'm the VP of strategy at Digital Domain, working with our clients and with our productions and how we're bringing AI technology to our to our films and to TV solutions. Um, I'm also actually on the board for the Visual Effects Society. I'm the co-chair along with Mark Spatney, who's here. So if anyone has any questions about Visual Effects Society, please reach out to us as well. Uh, hi, I, I swear I'm not on every panel, just a coincidence. <laughs> uh, I also swear that there aren't gonna be a minimum of two English people on every panel. So we will rely on Americans at some point. Uh, my name is James Knight, and uh, I run alliances for media and entertainment, I would say, uh, globally. Uh, so I work with the studios and a lot of creators and the, uh, and the ISVs, independent software vendors. That's the other thing, too. There's a lot of uh, uh, anagrams, and you know, people don't know what stuff stands for. So I always say, like, if I s rattle off OEM, I, I'll tell you what it, what it is, because people will be like, what the bloody hell is that? Yeah, yeah. I was at, I've been at AMD seven years, and... Um, uh, there's a term GAM uh, at, at AMD, and I said global account manager out loud, and somebody who'd been at AMD for 10 years said, I'm so, they IM'd me privately and said, I'm so glad you said that because I had no bloody idea what the hell that stood for. Guy walked around, guy walked around for years afraid yeah. to ask anybody. Yeah, he's like, I know what a GAM is, of course I know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I come from a production background and, and, and uh, a, a member of the Visual Effects Society like yourself and Ampass and, and, uh, and, and also BAFTA. So want to get uh, AMD continually to be involved in, uh, in content creation. So when I first started covering AI seven years ago, uh, we didn't really talk about AI. We talked about machine learning. So um, Bilal, why don't you just jump in here uh, and... Um, Give us your Google definition of machine learning and, and how it's being used and, and, and the difference between machine learning and AI. 
So uh, machine learning is a subset of AI, right? AI has historically had different definitions. Now it's suddenly synonymous with generative AI, just like, I don't know, Web3 and Metaverse somehow became synonymous. But machine learning is a different way to essentially program computers, right? Instead of giving it explicit instructions, you train it by giving it data, giving it examples of the type of output it should generate, and it kind of does the programming for you. And I think the big shift we've seen now uh, from machine learning to generative AI is like we've had two types of approaches, discriminative AI and now generative. Discriminative meaning it can like lightly understand, lightly predict things, right? Like next token prediction, like autocomplete, right? In your Gmail or something like that. But now it goes way beyond that to writing entire essays, producing images for you. And so I think like this is uh, the, the trajectory that we're on and, and that's really what you could boil down machine learning to. Um, Jessica, um, what's the difference between AI and, um, and the kind of recommendation algorithms um, that have gotten us into so much trouble? I'm going to uh, say that that's a question for that guy. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you Please. can Jessica Please. over here. Please. Jessica as Andy today. So yeah. sorry, what was Andy the from Microsoft. Uh, Andy from Microsoft, uh, what's the difference between AI and the recommendation algorithms that have gotten us into so much trouble over the past couple of years because it turns out that the technology meant to sell us t-shirts can also sell us very unhealthy ideas? Sure. Uh, a lot of the recommendations, uh, particularly uh, you know, to the, to the point that was just made, a lot of the, the things that we had today were highly trained and highly specific. You had to spend a lot of time training the algorithm and then it did sort of one thing. It was a one task. And that's really what the recommendation was as well. And it was a, a bit of a brute force. It was like, you like this, other people liked this. It's a, it's a halo effect piece. And now, the particularly when we look at a generative platform and a generalized uh, platform in a large language model, what you're doing is making inferences a lot of across much larger data sets. Uh, and those data sets are often tuned to, to a variety of things that are much more specific to you, much more specific to the content that you've been watching, and then also has information around sort of the, the cultural zeitgeist, what's being talked about in social media, and taking all of those vectors, that broader set of data, and being able to hone it in, you get a more explicitly accurate piece of information that, that feels more authentic. So that's an algorithm, but not AI. It's a, it's a, it is an algorithm, it, it is AI, but it's, 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 it's a generalized algorithm that's applying its knowledge against data that it's querying, whereas the other was a trained model that was just spitting back a result based on what it knew about about the, the pieces that were known. So uh, there's a much more limited, much more narrow focus and now taking in broader sets of data to do what it was doing. Uh, Rick, just uh, asking you a personal question because you've had such a long and varied career with technology. So um, how has your personal view and knowledge of AI evolved over the years? And, and how does that track with your experience at N NVIDIA? Initially, I knew nothing about it. So it was kind of, you know. Well, good. Uh, I think everybody here feels like that. Yeah. So it's 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 evolving so rapidly. Um, and uh, I guess my experience was initially looking at having a very specific and narrow problem that you're trying to solve. A lot of it is something that's very repetitious, something that is taking a lot of time and a lot of labor, and or just something that is boring and you just don't want to get it out of the way. So finding ways that you can, you know, automate that process. And then when you start looking at other things, like there, are, what are people spending their time on that is not core to their function, you know? And so you look at, you know, well, people are searching for stuff. Well, what if you don't know exactly what it's called? How do you find it? Can you search by using an image rather than searching by using text? Can you? So we're looking at all these different ways. And so I started getting into it as, you know, um, I was doing a lot of pipeline development for asset management systems and workflow automation, and it started off as what processes are out there that can help me you know, recognize the data coming in, and in a lot of cases, correct it. You know, you're getting, uh, you're ingesting data coming from, you know, coming from the field, whether it's camera data or, you know, images, and you can't always trust the metadata. Sometimes, like, you would like to think you can, but we started seeing discrepancies. So the first things we were doing is like, well, how can we look at processing the image using a computer vision algorithm to see if what the metadata is saying is actually accurate based on what we know of all the other images that we've seen over time? And then you start seeing results like, wow, 
this can actually do it. So this can make sure that what I'm taking in is, is accurate to what, I'm, what I need to see as a result. Um, and it's kind of like just blows up from there. Um, and what's happened more recently is, you know, people are looking at, you know, bigger and bigger um, problems to solve. And so you see, you know, companies that are looking at like entire end-to-end -end pipeline solutions. And then what we see with generative AI and what you can do with the transformer models today is just, just mind-blowing. But at the end of the day, you know, there's, you know, what's trending for people's curiosity and what's kind of just out there and like, I'm playing with this versus what's actually available to use in production. And so a lot of this is, you know, taking and looking at kind of like that, that approach of like, well, how do I make it so this is directable by an artist? Because anyone can hit a button and put in a prompt and like get a picture, but is that a picture that is, you know, um, something that's going to be utilized by the production in any way? And so we're looking at more the, that directed approach. Yeah, feel free to jump in. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you, am I doing it right? I am doing it right. Um, when you said, uh, I know I'm not the moderator, but I just w had a, a question. Um, from my right honourable friend at NVIDIA, AMD and NVIDIA do actually work together. So we are actually friendly, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> so when you said trust the metadata, is that because either it, it might be inaccurate in some cases or it's just not what the human, the artist, would want? Could be inaccurate. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, as things go, th like a lot of times metadata is lost. People are sending images around and things like, and so someone says, oh, okay, well, I'll just, like, I need to have metadata in order to pass this down the pipeline, so I will attach metadata to it. And so... Ah, so, so if, it's, if it's not directly from the source, it might, some of it might be stripped away, it might not, uh, the original metadata might not be there, that's what you mean type thing, not, okay, I understand, yeah. Now, now I'm doing it with the microphone. Uh, I know that um, not necessarily in the production side, but in the sort of the content management and the catalog management side, we see a lot of problems around the metadata, like languages and other things, where the Spanish and the French will get swapped uh, somehow in the metadata. And you might not catch that forever. And suddenly you're publishing content and you're, you're doing final QC checks and you're like, oh, all of Harry Potter has the wrong language on it. And it's like, okay. And so it's... You know, it's to that point of like sometimes the wrong. But you don't say anything. You won't tell them. Yeah, well, you know, they'll they'll figure it out in France, right? So, uh, for the panelists, the questions are not really tailored to any one of you. So, if if there's a topic you want to jump in on, just you know, give me the body language thing, and we'll make sure that you uh, get to contribute. No, don't want to take that call, um, Charlotte. Uh, same question for you. Um, when did you start hearing about AI, and when did it become um, something that was uh, front and center in your day-to-day -day job? Yeah, absolutely. So I think like many people, I know about AI from sci-fi. <laughs> and I work in visual effects because I have a love of fantasy, of science fiction. And so we have a preconceived idea of what AI could be. And um, I think for some people that can be a little scary. Um, in terms of the reality of AI, really comes with my joining DD. So I joined Digital Domain two years ago, um, very much in the thing and um, business development part, um, and starting to learn about our technical solutions that we were able to offer the client is really what um, delved me deeper and deeper into learning more about AI and speaking to some of the experts at our company. So Digital Domain has been creating humans really since um, Benjamin Button, the curious case of Benjamin Button back in 2008. But the first time we actually used machine learning was with Thanos on Endgame um, and Infinity Wars. So the difference really w at that point is how can we use the machine learning to, to train um, the model? We used it for, um, we have a proprietary software actually called Masquerade. And Masquerade actually is the performance capture. And that performance capture and training was able to capture the nuance of the performance. And it all starts with the actor. It all starts with Josh Brolin and amazing performance that we want to then capture that detail, a lot of data feed into our internal models. And obviously, we have to be very careful about security. It's really important to our clients. So we have proprietary software. We have in-house data systems modeling um, and this machine learning that we're able to then utilize. Um, so then... <laughs> Actually, for that, it was only about uh, 20 minutes of screen time for Thanos. 
Um, but when we did She-Hulk, um, it was around 40 minutes. Um, we actually bought a new layer in beyond actually capturing the, um, the performance of Tatiana. We actually then were looking at th what's so difficult with digital humans, and this is really where we're using AI to solve a problem that we have, um, which is that uncanny valley that you can get with creating a digital human. So um, with our high demand from our clients and our high standards for ourselves, we actually started to use um, something that we've developed, which is called Charlatan. And Charlatan is a proprietary face swapping tool, a deep fake tool, if you will. And what we actually did was take that to overlay on top of the asset that we'd already built to really take it to that extra level of buy-in, that extra level of human quality that made her so believable. So combining the performance, the, the machine learning to be able to scale our artists, to get them quicker, to get them to that really fantastic solution. Uh, machine learning was really crucial to that, but it, it certainly doesn't replace the artistry. It's, it's a combination, it's a tool to be used, it's a way of scaling up to get there faster and be able to do more iterations and have more input from our clients. Great, um, James. Uh, we watched the evolution of machine learning, and at least from the outside, it looked like um, it kind of put uh, AI, it provided the kind of power and data that AI needed to create um, good models. Um, is data what is driving this inflection point? Um, is, is it labeling? What, what happened specifically that brought us to this point, or brought OpenAI, they were the first to go, but there are many other companies now making LLMs, um, large language models. Was e ev yeah, evolution, evolution of te technology, um, or <laughs> really, <laughs> I, I suppose, technically speaking, a computer has always been artificial intelligence, a form of it, right? I, I think maybe when you, when you bleed over into, or when you move over into having a computer, a chip, a series of chips, fake emotion, right? That's when it the people start noticing, ooh, the AI is actually a thing because now it's going to make things that I can feel uh, about when I when I watch um, or or when I when I read it. So I, I think maybe uh, it, it, it's it's just that it's unfortunately that not unfortunately that's the wrong word. It's the, it's the natural evolution of or the unnatural evolution of of technology. And um, one thing you were saying um, in as far as DD, when you when you you take the the performance capture of Brolin and use that for the twenty minute screen time for Thanos. Um, I think f uh, in as far as uh, uh, feature film content creation, um, there are going to be multiple artists that work on that character, and you want consistency. So there's there's sort of a, like a graduated template that that uh, none of the artists will be able to go below, so you have that consistency. So you won't look at Thanos in one scene and the next scene go, oh yeah, that was uh, that was that guy we just hired the other day. Look, I mean, he completely screwed that up. It, it, it's it, so uh, from that perspective, AI can, I, is sort of a safety net as well um, because it, it, it can, it can at, at least make sure that there's a minimum level of, of quality and authenticity to a, a, an actor's performance. I'd, I'd just like to add to that as well, the 20 minutes and then it was 40 minutes actually for She-Hulk, but we recently completed um, for the quarry 30 hours of performance capture. So machine learning was absolutely crucial to be able to scale up, to be able to take on that type of huge amount of work for multiple characters. Yeah, That's a long movie. That's a lot of data. I, I think uh, back to the original part of the question, one of the big things that has happened is you look at like, um, Transformer models are kind of like the big thing right now. And you have they have worked on with um, emergent capabilities. You give it a little bit of data, you can ask it a question, and you can get a simple answer. If it trains on a lot more data, it can get a more complex answer. You give it more and more data, and all of a sudden it can give you the answer in another language. Or it can start generating code that that code will give you the answer. And so we hit this point where it's like, oh, more and more data, and nice things, I don't have to label that data because it's going to learn like a person does like it just it'll just kind of recognize it from its environment you give it more and more and it gets smarter and smarter and it gets these new abilities 
But then you hit that inflection point. It's like, now I have to have so much data that is like computationally impossible to get better. So the, I think the big thing now is looking at, well, there are processes called distillation. It's like, well, I've had all this data to create this model that can do anything, but I don't need to do anything. I need to do this one thing really well. So you're asking the model, well, you've been trained to know everything. Tell me what I need to know to train a model to just do this one thing. And so now you've gone to these huge, we call foundation models, which are used by you know, OpenAI and, and us and others. And the idea is like, give me the data set that I need in order to make a very targeted model that is small enough that maybe I can run on a mobile device so that I can easily run on an edge device um, and provide something specific to whatever my, my customers need. So you're, you're referring to, and Bilal, this is a good question for you, you're, you're referring to starting to train your own models so that you can get consistency and so that they understand the project and the aesthetic of the project. I think train your own models if you need to train your own models. You know, like yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot right. of great things out there. Right, if you need to. But if you need to, definitely. And, you know, we look at the idea of augmenting, you know, a model. So you've got a model that has been trained with all this stuff, and then you fine-tune it with your data set. So you can take the advantage of, you know, um, I want to recreate all the characters from this, from this you know, um, particular franchise. You know, um, they all know the same things about the world, but then I want to have the response delivered in the persona of each character. So you have this overall fine-tuning that you're going to have on the model. So it knows how to, like, you know, formulate an answer or con converse with you, but then it knows the lore of the universe. And then on top of that, you want to be able to, instead of having to have a model for every single person, you want to have that generalized model, but then have the system there, be there able to. There are two great examples of this that have been in the news, right? One is Showrunner AI. I don't know if you all have heard about this. I wrote a popular story about it two weeks ago. It is a text to episode generator, but the text is like two words like, put this model of Charlie into a South Park episode. So it was running South Park because it's really simple pa paper cutouts. And it ate all the so South Park episodes. And so you give it a character. You give it a setting in which, you know, do you want Ka Cartman, Kenny, the whole gang? Do you want the teachers? And, and then it spews out in seconds uh, an entire episode with editing, scoring, um, voices. Uh, as always, the voices, nah, sound is always the biggest challenge, partly because you can't see it. Um, but uh, I, I thought that was uh, a really, really uh, interesting story. They're not releasing it. And uh, I think probably, if not right now, maybe soon, they're going to get a cease and desist from Comedy Central. Um, oh. You know, it's, it's not for profit, which is a great thing to say if you're afraid somebody's gonna sue you, um, you don't wanna be seen as m making money, but Ted Shilowitz said on our podcast, that is true, but they're raising money from venture capitalists, so is it not for profit, really? Or not for profit, like that piece of content isn't generating a profit, but their motives are, are for profit. So um, that sort of takes us down the rabbit hole of, of intellectual property, which is, is sort of what we started off talking about, right? Because, I mean, one of the things about AI, I'm a, sorry, I'm not a panelist, I'm just gonna go on. Uh, one, one of the things about AI is that everything it makes is familiar, right? It's, I mean, it's, Bilal, right? I mean, that's the uncanny thing about it is that it operates on nostalgia. And that's scary, right? Well, well it's, it feels it's like it, you, it knows something about you. <laughs> or the distillation of all of us, right? Like yeah. All the stuff, like, to your earlier data po point and then the customized models, I mean, like, Data is absolutely the new oil, right? Like that's the popular saying, and it's fueling these large pre-trained model. Like if we go back four hype cycles ago, big data was like the term du jour, right? And in a sense, Web 2.0 with like all these UGC platforms, we've been producing all this image, text, audio, video, data that's going out there, right? And like it is in a sense a reflection of us and you know, I think the popular thing to say is like it's a distillation of all human knowledge and creativity. And now you can argue, I mean, Reddit is a part of that. Is that entirely knowledge? I don't know, but it certainly is a reflection <laughs> of us. But then you've got this massive model, right? Like stable diffusion to me is wild because that's like 200 terabytes of imagery that's been distilled down to this like five gigabyte file, right? That can basically conjure up all this stuff that's familiar. And to you me. can run it on the laptop on your desk, right? So right. stable diffusion, the, the um, horse has left the barn. Yeah. There is no regulating it. Right, it's running on laptops and computers all over the world 
right now. Totally. And so so people who are going to regulate are going to have a hard time because like regulating mercury at this point. Oh, my God. And I was talking to somebody who's working on the data uh, uh, content authenticity initiative. Like provenance is such a hard problem, right? Yeah. So it's funny to me that like speaking as like an indie creator on this panel of like, you know, largely corporate folks, right? It's like I wonder if you all would agree with the fact that there's almost like a trickle up effect happening here where it's like the <laughs> indies that are – more unencumbered to go play with these models. I mean, you did some amazing Forbes pieces on, uh, you know, like indies that are creating these cinematic style trailers, right? Yeah. Do, do you guys know this? That cinematic AI is a thing, and its primary manifestation is fake movie trailers. I mean, who knew we could have a film festival and have two hours of uh, generative AI? Um, film trailers. Now, part of that is that the video output is only four seconds long, so a trailer is generally a montage, so it, it lends That's itself to it. Yeah. You have no um, continuity, and it's like, cool it, image, cool image, cool image, maybe some motion in there. and Exactly, yeah. and you throw up a title, oh. danger, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, Cut. but yeah, but those things are, are, uh, are great because they relieve the artists of the responsibility of the two things that are very hard for indies to compete on. Uh, one is story and the other is dialogue. And the third one, which is a problem that we all share, is sound. Um, and that's where, but the images themselves are stunning. Now, a follow-up question. One of the problems that those artists face is they're using an off-the-shelf model. They're not using self-trained models. So their problem is um, image and shot matching because even though it's a montage, it has to look like it's from the same movie. And uh, that is a prompt art. Totally. Like, how do you uh, fine tune these models using Dream Booth or LoRa? How do you, like, really, you know, essentially, like, the prompt engineering part that was earlier brought up, though? Not a huge fan of that term. Yeah. I think because you're totally because right. where's the engineering? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it, this is a user experience problem. It, it's me, a diet, right? trust me. Pro you know, ML whisperer, right? Like, or whatever <laughs> term we're, we're going to come up with. But. I think it's funny because, again, this is where it's interesting, right? There's all these, like, data use, like, the fact that these large foundational models were trained on, let's say, you know, imagery off the internet, you know, how do you know the provenance of Lion 5B, all this other stuff, and then is training on copyright material fair use? That's still an open debate. But even with the tools, to your point, that creators have, like, there are all these, like, constraints, right? It's like, it can do these things and it can't do these things, right? Yeah, you can't have your character randomly change eye color between shots, right? And so I think that's where the, the places where this stuff is thriving is like taking these tools and fitting them into kind of classical and existing workflows where you do, do go into After Effects or Nuke or whatever and add that final consistency and polish and kind of work with those constraints. But yeah, it's like I see this gamut between like, I don't know, what, what you mentioned about how do you get these things production ready. I feel like there's a huge chasm that we need to cross to get there in certain aspects to be truly controlled and production ready. And I think control is the big problem that everyone's trying to solve right now. And I think w when you look at it like right now, it's, you know, you've got a lot, of, a lot of stuff that's out there that's fairly technical to utilize, you know, and um, a lot of it's coming from research and then people are, you know, startups are starting all over the place. But what's going to start happening is like we're partnering with companies that actually own their data sets. So like we haven't released a model in the wild, you know, even though we've done a lot of the research, because yeah, Adobe Firefly, right? They, well, they we work with Adobe Firefly, and they have like, hey, they have this Adobe stock catalog. They have all these images they have the rights to. They can train their own model. Right. We're working with Shutterstock. We're working with Getty Images. Getty Images has the billions of images that you need in order to create. Right. Meta just solution. put out a, a model for making audio, and it was all based on licensed audio. Licensed There's audio. no uh, scraping up the internet and stealing everybody's music. Exactly. So when those services are going to be coming available, and they'll also look at adding, OK, well, if you're going to be fine tuning these, you fine tune it with the images that you own, that you have the rights to. And so then you can make that customized version of it. But you don't need to spend the time, the money, and the effort of creating that foundational model, because that's been done by you know, Shutterstock and Getty and Adobe. And yeah, I, I think, though, on the, uh, on the tuning part, I think what, what comes around, and this is a, a piece we've been uh, talking about at Microsoft more and more, is bringing your own data sets to the, the algorithm or to the, to, the, to the GPT or whatever it is doesn't necessarily mean you have to retune anything. You're just using it to get the, the right query and the right response, and then it builds something off of your data set. But you don't have to introduce your data set into the training model as part of that, which means you're protecting yourself. You're basically 
air gapping your intellectual property from the trained model. So you're getting the result you need, but you're also keeping your security and your, your peace of mind and your IP where it needs to be. Right. Yeah, I was just gonna add that research and inspiration from historical art and architecture is, is not a new part of the creative process. We've been doing this for, this is just a way of helping us to get there quicker. And unfortunately, AI is not a magic button. Anyone who has a vision in their head and is looking for AI to, to solve that quickly for them, I think will find themselves quickly frustrated by the tools that are available at the moment and will find themselves going back to traditional hands-on methods. They can take the models that and inspiration, but there's still a creative um, process of actually decision-making, of choosing this image over that image and um, using those tools to help you get there quicker, but you still need that artistry, you still need that 20% on top of that that makes it very human, very unique. Uh, I will say this in my experience covering the topic, there is a chasm that exists between professional storytellers and other people trying to prompt AI. And uh, Eugene Chung, who's a director, volumetric director, uh, who I know well, sent me a AI scene that he made on a ski lift in Park City on his phone when all this started to hit in, uh, this was last semester, so it must have been in the fall. And um, he came up with a prompt that was an orc breaking up with an elf in a 1950s diner in iambic pentameter. It was freaking great because he's an artist, right? Who else would think of that? So, you know, this idea that, oh, by the way, all these great, and well, again, I think your comment on this would be very welcome, but, you know, all these great AI things that you're seeing are edited on Adobe Premiere, they're scored, they're written, the choices that get made on which shots to use and which shots to redo, and, you know, all that's a human, right? So the end product, what we look at and we go, oh my God, yeah, it was kind of shot with AI, but everything else is still a human. It, it's another tool in the toolbox, right? And I think people, this is why we're not going to have like prompt a movie and have that be great. I mean, what a dystopian future where it's just like a TikTok style algorithm and it's just a feed of generative content, right? And then just that's all. And then there's some sort of feedback loop with your biometric signals or whatever. Hey, maybe that could happen in some capacity, but I certainly hope that is not the main future. But to your point, it's all about taste, right? And I think like there are yes. re really interesting uh, approaches, you know, such as control net where, you know, like text is such a freaking fickle way to describe the intricate composition of a, a scene. And yeah, you could mash up some very unique and powerful tokens, but you know, if you're a trained, you know, visual artist and you know how to use a Wacom tablet and you know exactly the composition you want, now you can just sketch out some scribbles and then use that as a basis. So I think the 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 we'll have higher bandwidth ways to and again, you're talking there models. about training your own model. D yeah, or, or prompting it in... in, in uh, giving it a visual ways. prompt totally, r yeah. rather than a text yeah, prompt. Yeah, to your point. Right. Yeah, it's, it's more of that, like to me, you're, like, you're absolutely right. Just saying it is another tool in the toolbox is the right way to think about it. And to me, it's really a democratization, right? Like, like if we think about like what Avid did for editing in the 90s, it brought in a lot more work. Some of that work was great. Some of it was garbage. Uh, and, and like I think any new innovation in, in the tech stack, you're going to see that sort of initial piece until we figure out what is the way we use this in the language of filmmaking or production or other elements to do what we want. So we're in that early stage of seeing it, but we're going to see refinement of it so rapidly because it, it is, it is uh, advancing so and evolving so rapidly as part of this. Still have to put. You still have to put actual work into something. I th I think uh, when yeah, uh, honestly, it's about the idea, yeah, right? If yeah, it's, it has to be a great idea, otherwise, it doesn't matter what it looks like. Well, we've we've all got. I don't know. Everybody has knows a ridiculously talented person uh, in their friend group. But if if that friend is inherently lazy, that talent <laughs> is never going to be seen. You can't just be talented and then not have some grit. Right, the same thing is true of AI. You can you can embrace it, but if you're just looking for the soft option or the shortcut, I'm just going to use AI, hit enter, and then publish it on YouTube. You're not going to get a million bloody hits. You've got to actually put some work in. Because everyone else is doing that, and you have now a bunch of mid content, right, to yeah. use the 
to use the Gen Z term. It, it's like a, it, it's a multiplier. So if you're not a creator, you can start creating stuff. But if you are a creator, you'll be a 10x, 100x creator. Yeah, because some of these trailers that we were talking about were made in a day, right? I mean, things that would take you Weeks, know, film students months. months, months and months to make can be made in eight hours. So that is really wild, right? That you could be a film student and instead of you know needing to get 12 people and check out all this equipment, that, that you can kind of, with some patience and some help, and watching a lot of YouTube videos. It's not unlike learning a game engine. YouTube is your main instructor. If you cannot learn from YouTube, you don't even try. Um, well, I think this actually brings a new challenge for us in this time because things are moving so quickly. We actually have a steering AI steering committee at Digital Domain that is looking at all the new releases, all the hot topics that are coming out and making decisions about what is useful to our production process? What has value and where? And how do we focus our time? Because we can't look at all of them. There's a lot happening very quickly. But I think in terms of the visual effects society as well, how can we support our artist community? How can we help them embrace these new tools that are available and, and really learn techniques in a, in a way that's uh, helpful to them and help them make the decisions of, of where to start as well? I would say a lot of it comes down to um, what is their required quality for the output? So you see a lot of these things, and like if you look at it on your phone, you don't care about the resolution, and you don't care that you know there's an explosion in the background, but the explosion is not moving, even though the people are. <laughs> like some, so yeah. it, it just depends on you know what, right. what you're great trying for, to get out Great of it. for storyboards or concept art. Or yeah. concepts. And as we get more targeted tools, like specifically like if you use um, you know machine learning as a way to you know improve like computational fluid dynamics. So now I can do this giant ocean destroying, you know, New York City, and it only takes me a day to compute instead of a week to compute. That's huge. Yeah, 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 absolutely gonna change things and, and democratize things. Al although, as I said, the people for whom it's being democratized generally lack some of the critical skills, great ideas, great storytelling, great sound, that, that ultimately is gonna produce uh, content that people would, would pay for. Um, so uh, let me go back to one question about Microsoft because I think we sort of skipped over this inflection sure. point. In, at the beginning of CES, so this is like January 1st, I was moderating a panel with Aaron Luber from Google. And I don't know if you guys can go back to the ancient days of January where there was a major worldwide freak out and a four alarm fire at Google where people were like running down the hall with their pants on fire. And Aaron Luber calmly said, Google has always been an artificial intelligence company. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, every Google executive is walking around the world saying that right now. So um, getting to Microsoft, was there that moment at Microsoft where sort of it became clear you were going to add open AI and people were running down the hall with their pants on fire? You know, it's, it's funny, it, it came about uh, slowly and then all at once, right? Like AI is not a new thing at Microsoft. I, I remember some of the, I mean, we've had a cognitive services team doing a ton of things with, with some of the more directed trained models since the, the early days of Azure, like 2010, 2014, that, that time frame. We've, we've had work going. Microsoft Research has been in, in the AI and ML space since, frankly, the 90s. So there's been a ton of research, and then the momentum and the pivot came really around things like OpenAI and this next wave and the early investments we made there that that became the game changers. And, and the slide that I started using in January, probably right around the time of CES, is the, the true gift of AI is that I don't have to talk about metaverse anymore. And that was. I know crazy. somebody right. mentioned Web three, and I had sort of a deja got, vu. Like PTSD, nobody has asked Web3, me about yeah. blockchain or NFT yeah. in months, and yeah. it was like truly a gift. I know it really. Well, you know, all I could say is that when he said uh, that metaverse and Web three uh, went together somehow, I was like, oh, that's last year's conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we don't have to go there. Uh, so, uh, by the way, not related, my bug. Uh, <laughs> Bilal, um, here's a question. Actually, of all the panelists, I send the questions in advance uh, that I'm thinking about, and um, usually have one or two responses, usually the morning of, because people are busy and they have other things to do, but Bilal is an artist, so he jumped in early with a great question and one close to my heart because I've spent so much time uh, covering extended reality. So how about a question about the relationship between AI and XR? 
i.e. AI's role in perception stacks underpinning AR VR platforms and now increasingly in content generation and in gameplay itself. So uh, there's a lot of ways to unpack that, but since it's your question, go. All right, yeah, I mean, oh, metaverse, sorry. We're gonna talk no, about it. Carry on, yeah. you, you could do it, I don't have to. <laughs> now I think like uh, machine learning has been such a key part of AR VR platforms, right? On the perception si side, basically real time motion tracking, you know, slam tech, depth perception, you know, how do you deal with occlusions? How do you deal with relighting? How do you deal with anchoring and relocalizing content? All that type of stuff, right? Computer so vision. Computer vision, basically, right? Which is like, and some of that was ML-based computer vision, some of it was just like classical computer vision. And, you know, that was kind of invisible to the user, right? But we all talked about similar things, I think, when Metaverse and AR, VR, you know, or AR, VR, and then Metaverse is sort of the catch-all term predominantly driven by Meta, uh, Facebook's rebranding to Meta, kind of made it the all-encompassing. VR and metaverse are not the same thing. Oh, I, I agree. So let's just. If VR, AR is a way, is a. Is that's a stipulation. It's a, it's a hardware to experience yeah. the metaverse. You can experience it on a 2D device, right? The point being, like, we were all like, yes, we're going to have UGC 3D. It's going to be awesome, just like we make YouTube videos. And everyone's like, wait, like, everyone's going to go learn, like, Blender and Maya? <laughs> and, like, how are we going to optimize these assets? And who's going to put this into Unity and Unreal and imbue it with interactivity? And I think finally with generative AI, we have this technology, and you're seeing it in the early stages, right? Like, you know, uh, certainly all the reality capture, neural radiance fields, improvements to photogrammetry, to digitize reality, but also to create you know, pull 3D models out of latent space. I think in this, like, is exciting because now we can finally, in a time and cost efficient fashion, populate the so-called metaverse. And that's exciting to me. And plus the AI agent stuff, which you've covered too. I mean, the South Park thing is an example of that. Now we don't have to have these, like, NPCs. And let's not comment on the trend where on TikTok people yeah, are uh, pretending the other, to be NPCs. The other story I was referring to earlier that I didn't finish that thought was yeah. InWorld which creates um, sentient non-player characters. It's sentient in quotes, please. Uh, but it, it, it can imbue non-player characters with, with goals and a backstory and you know, things we would, would associate with, with human characters. And in fact, they have some autonomy. It's not a branching dialogue. They actually say things based on what they feel. Westworld, right? Narratives. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd like to jump Please in here. Jump in. Um, actually, this is the natural progression for us for the digital human um, is ABH. So we have um, Zoe, who is an autonomous virtual human, and she she brings all of these tools that we have now created together. So we're using the masquerade, we're using the performance capture, we're using charlatan in a live way to actually help give that uh, humanized look to her. We're, we're also connecting with chatbots and um, able to ha have a, a dialogue with Zoe. Um, and things like machine learning cloth has enabled us to do this in real time. And right now, she is on a machine at DD Studios. But the next step for us is, is looking to, to get Zoe into the cloud so that we can actually um, scale that up. Yeah. So I see Rick fidgeting because I know these uh, these uh, questions are somewhat uh, ser seriously relevant to you. Um, 3D modeling, 3D virtual spaces, and AI. Possible? Oh, yes. I mean, we're seeing it now. I mean, there are models out there. But that You have work. Omniverse, right, which would be a platform for that. Um, yeah, I mean, Omniverse is a platform for developing an application that does not exist. So the idea is there's there are a lot of tools in the chain right now. Um, people are moving more and more towards 3D content. How do you have a system that allows you to tie everything together? So we're working, you know, with um, it's now OpenUSD, so kind of an, an open eye, you know, 3D standard for describing these scenes, um, describing these interactions, and making it so that we can use the existing tools that you have on your in your current workflow. So you don't have to relearn everything. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to make it so those tools communicate effectively with each other. And then also when you have new capabilities, like, huh, I want to have, um, you know, an AI texture generator you know, in my 3D scene. So I'll have like high resolution assets up here, but you know, I, I found this thing, you know, you know, or I captured this thing, but I want to change it from, you know, a red carpet to a blue carpet. It's in the background, I don't care about it. I'm not gonna spend time painting it. Maybe I can have a texture automatically generated for that. So adding these AI tools. So for us, it's a, it's a platform for our internal development so that we can like everything that we do around generative AI and, and um, graphics in general has one place to live. 
but then just making it available to everybody else, whether you're in manufacturing or metering. Yeah, I, I, I love this idea because what you're saying is, is that inside of a, a, a 3D environment you might be looking at in Blender or Unity, um, AI might be able to play a role in, okay, you built a wall, but it can suggest what the wall's gonna be. Yeah, and, and AI tools have been out there for artists for, for years. Like we released, um, uh, referred to as a, an auto encoder for denoising years ago with our optics platform. And the idea was, you know, an artist would sit there and wait for minutes to hours to even get to the, the image rendered to a point where they could make a decision on whether or not, you know, they needed to make a change to the lighting, you know? And we made something that doesn't just interpolate the pictures, but actually revisualizes it so that you know you can make that decision. It kind of looked more like a like a watercolor in some respects at a at low number of samples, but you could make that decision on whether or not you needed to make a change to the lighting or materials, and it did that nearly instantaneously, a few milliseconds. So rather than waiting, you know, minutes or hours, you waited for the first few passes. You hit the button, like, oh, that's what it's going to look like. I could make the change. Um, and now almost every renderer out there has a denoiser. And usually instead of like rendering to the ground truth of you know 20 hours from now, you render to a certain point and then you denoise the rest. Um, and those are the types of tools that we see you know coming to the forefront. And, you know, looking at taking it into you know AR and you know XR environments. You know, what if you only had to generate the rendering for one eye and then you could infer the other eye from it? Now you need half the computational power you know that you needed before. Um, you know, both uh, us and AMD have. Uh, super resolution algorithms. So we have ours called DLSS. And the idea is you can render the image at one quarter of the resolution and in a few milliseconds it you know quadruples it. So you get a much higher frame rate and higher fidelity, but without taxing the compute resources. So your compute resources can, you know, be more efficient. And that's the name of the game these days. So I've been talking for a long time and in fact it was the topic of my second book, the Universal Visual Browser. Universal visual browser is what would go in your glasses and make them an all-day, everyday wearable, and it's based on AI. And the way the universal visual browser works is, <coughs> of course, I'm a glasses wearer, uh, and the way it works is it knows who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. It can, couldn't do that without, a, without AI, right? It knows, are you driving into the sun? Are you reading in the dark? Um, do you need uh, magnifying? Because you're you're older, I need you know if I'm reading in a low light environment, I I need readers, right? I'm one of those annoying old people with flashlights in a restaurant trying to look at a at a menu. So a universal visual browser would be the only way to address that and put that kind of intelligence in eyewear. And then if you want to add your tweets and the weather or directions, great. But for me as a glasses wearer, I want those things. If I'm going to go through the trouble. Right, there's a lot of friction, right? Because you're still carrying your regular glasses because what if your all day, every day glasses malfunction, you won't be able to drive home. So y there's a lot of friction involved with doing this even when the technology is perfect. So the benefit has to be so substantial that people would put, put up with that. And I think the benefit is gonna be derived from AI, AI and that is to me the relationship between XR and AI and it may be that XR will be nothing but a training tool for business and a niche game console until that happens. I think a large part of it is also understanding the environment, right? So there's a lot of systems that are being put out there. You look at autonomous vehicles, you know, um, fidelity of what they need to understand is getting higher and higher. Not, not only do you need to understand that, you know, there's a stop sign or traffic signal. What if the signal is out and there's an officer that's directing traffic? You need to know if the hand is stop or go. And that's a very subtle motion. And depending on the size of the sensors, it could be only a few pixels. But through machine learning, um, we can learn to detect that. And you can also learn to detect in the cabin, is the person driving falling asleep? You know, are they paying attention? You know, if it's asking a question to the in-car system, which of the five people in the car ask that question? And, so and that's going to help the blind to see. There's actually some great, great things that we haven't even thought about that are gonna change the world for, yeah. for a lot of people. So James, uh, we've got a few minutes left here. Let me bring it back to virtual production. We're on this wonderful virtual production stage with this unbelievably large screen um, behind us. So help me understand in the virtual production pipeline where AI is poking itself. We talked about in content creation, but how, how does that work in actual virtual production, which I think is the thing most people here are interested in, actually. Well, as far as uh, 
I, th I would say, so I'm going to share this with Rick because the uh, real-time production and, and the, the real-time aspect to, to virtual production is very much a GPU process. AMD's role is typically um, between setups. So you, you, uh, a director says that, actually, I want the sun to be uh, at 10 o'clock and I want this tree in a different location. And so you, you can render that out a lot quicker if you were to use Threadripper or Epic CPUs. And with the more lanes you can, you can plug in uh, even more NVIDIA GPUs than, than, than you were used to. Um, personally, not uh, had a lot of experience using AI in, in virtual production yet. So I don't, I don't uh, one of the things I pride myself on is not BSing, right? So, uh, so, I do, so, so that's why I'd like to share. No, that's, I mean, I love a so true, true answer. So, so it makes it appear like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Right. Um, uh, uh, so I, I know that uh, it was used a lot on. I, I didn't get to go to set in Leedston, but it was our, our tech and Rick's tech was used a lot for for Barbie. Um, um, one of the one of the gents that worked at Fox Visual Effects Labs, we worked with Nvidia and and Unreal, and one of the things Simon mentioned it earlier that 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 studios want to mitigate the risk of making a bad film, so. Uh, they'll use virtual production to make a film before it's greenlit and, and see if a, a film sort of in, in essence sort of works. It's good enough. We've tested it with our families so and executives. Let's go ahead and make it. So they make the film before they make the film in an idea to mitigate the risk because no one actually knows how to make a great film. If they did, all of them would be great. So, um, well, w they would, wouldn't they, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, if there were a, a magic machine that would you just put the script in and it would tell you what the box office was? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe that's what they fear. That's where that's going, right? But I don't think it's going to go. Even I mean, if it could just break out that script into shots with me, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, got a feeling directors like to do that, someone told me. Well, that's the shortcut, isn't it? Like, <laughs> make me a good film. Make it about Barbie. You know what? Let's have Ryan Gosling in it. It will sell. Right, <laughs> I, I don't think it worked quite that way. How they start, but <laughs> that's how they start. Uh, Charlie, coming back to your question about virtual production, so performance capture is a part of the virtual production process as well as these shiny screens behind me. Um, and what we're actually looking into is using machine learning in terms of that facial performance capture without any tracking dots on the space, a face. And anyone who's gone through a production where you have to do this, uh, an actor or an actress and put those tracking dots on day in, day out, after lunch, after snack. <laughs> this is a real game changer, not only for the talent and their experience, but also for the time taken actually on set, which obviously for our clients has a cost implication. So I think this is a really good use case scenario. I think uh, one of the, the easy ones we could talk about, um, uh, we released some information about work we did with ILM and their stagecraft system, um, simply uh, being able to search for backgrounds. So they have this massive library of, of HDRs they've shot for different types of skies and sky patterns and being able to just use a natural language search to find, you know, what fits the mood that's being asked for. So that's, you know, that's, uh, we call it deep search. It's integrated. It's part of Omniverse. But, um, you know, that's kind of like the starting point. And now you can get into, okay, well, I found an image as a starting point, but let's see if we can use generative AI because I need to have this integrated in the background. I need to make these small changes to it. And I think that's what's going to come next. Uh, I'll, I'll throw one more at, at Rick, a, a, a high five around the work you guys are doing around things like lip sync, uh, where you're taking and uh, as part of the dubbing process, making it look like the mouth is actually saying the words, really just through, you know, taking the existing frames and being able to update it for, for known shapes with that the mouth would make when it's using different language, that's, that's great work, and it makes for a smoother user experience on the, the viewer. Yeah, I think localization is going to be huge. You know, the idea that you've, it doesn't matter, you know, the language that you shot your, your media in, being able to release it so it looks natural in any other, you know, locality, I think is going to be huge. There's a, there's a company, I don't know if you guys have heard of, of it, Flawless, Flawless AI. Um, have you heard of them? Yeah, it's remarkable. There's a, I forget the name of the film, it's a monosyllabic title. And the premise was th these actresses uh, get trapped up 
uh, high, the, the ladder gets uh, falls away, and the whole premise of the film is they're, they're on this rooftop, um, and there's a lot of swearing involved. And so they, they wanted, a, I guess, a PG or a PG-13 version, so they created this the algorithms where they would replace, replace all the F-bombs with friggin', and it was so very good, friggin', I don't know, whatever is, a pr is okay with Americans because they don't like swearing. Um, so we love language in my country and your country. Um, <laughs> so, so you can't say that in a meeting, James. How many times have I told you? Um, uh, but they, they played back uh, clips from, you know, takes from the film to the, the actors themselves, and they didn't know when it was them or when it wasn't them. And then they also went a step further and, and they got their same voice, their same actual voice in Japanese and Portuguese. And, and I feel like that's a great area too where AI it. is, is going to be that's used it. in foreign a language. The actors who are reading subtitles, right? The actors in France who are dubbing Brian Gosling, out of work. Uh, yeah, they, they, <laughs> don't, they don't know what he, how, how he sounds so amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the first use cases we're going to see is the idea of you know ADR. Yeah. So you've shot something on set and it was great, but you know we need to make this one change to the scene, um, and being able to bring the performer back into the booth and while recording ADR, you've got some cameras set up for reference, but that reference can then be used to drive the facial changes as well. So you've already got footage of the actor on set in the right lighting condition, and now you're looking to just do that lip sync. Um, component to it. So I think a lot of these technologies, and they're going to be brought to market by DD and the different ISDs out there that are actively looking at solving these production use cases. It makes a lot of sense as well if you're already building that digital double of the actor or actress for a stunt, uh, something that they're not able to do physically. So then, yeah, they're starting to re revisit this use that they can, they can have as well. So we have nobody on this stage who is an actor or um, is a member of the Writers Guild. So we're all, like everybody else here, sort of standing back, watching and waiting to go back to work. Um, do you think their concerns are legitimate or overstated? Why did everybody look at me? <laughs> I mean, you listen, it's, it's like Jeopardy, you just pass. Just yeah. pass. No, look, I, I think, I don't <laughs> think anybody really understands AI, and I'm not pointing at any unions that are on strike, everybody's got the right and 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 wants to make sure they preserve and do what's right for for their for their folks. But nobody, it's too early days to understand the implications of where this is going. Like we as technologists don't know everywhere that it's going to go and how we're going to use it. We're just trying to shape and steer it in the right way. And I think ignoring it is the wrong way to look at it. Embracing it and using it for what it can and pointing it in the directions where there is value is is the right approach to take. Per personally, I and I've suggested to many parties, all of whom did not want my input, that there should be some committee made up of union members and producers that every year can look at the advancements in technology and try and figure out what changes need to be made in the contract. The problem is these contracts get made and they last for five or 10 years, which in the pace of face of technological change is, is, is ridiculous. I think a lot of this is gonna, you know, um, again, center around quality. You know, like I can hire my neighbor's kids to star in this thing and end up with, well, someone who's untrained, you know, has no performance, you know, background, and I, I get what I get. But you're hiring writers and actors because of what they've shown that they can do and they can prove. What I like about AI is, I can remove certain aspects um, that are intrinsic to that performer, like their appearance, but I can apply their performance mm -hmm. to someone else. I can make that, we see a lot of like making someone older or younger. You know, what if, you know, there are other aspects of it. We've seen, you know, with Avatar and, you know, with, with Thanos, I can make someone a believable, you know, alien, you know, things that we can't do with makeup. And so I think that's the thing that we're going to be looking at, you know, in the near future is how can we, you know, take the performance of, of, of these artists and help drive them in new ways. I would echo what you said earlier about the genies out of the bottle, right? So I think fighting this is going to be exceedingly challenging. We'll have models such as Adobe's that have rock solid data provenance. We'll have hopefully some sort of legal outcome of whether or not you can train on copyrighted material and if that's fair use or not. But I think like, 
there is an awesome force multiplier effect everyone should be ho harnessing, right? Unsurprisingly, I'm totally lean into this. But historically, you've had sort of this like T-shape analogy of, you know, you're broad in certain areas, so you can work, work cross-functionally, and then you build your deep well of expertise in a certain area. I think the fact that we're going to start orchestrating these AI agents, if you will, these models, lets us go from being like T-shaped to a tripod or a table. And you know, like if you're a writer, you can start making visuals. If you can make visuals, you can suddenly make animations. If you're doing animations, you can practically be a director. And directors can start doing all of this stuff and really you know, crystallizing their vision, what's in their head, in a far more concrete sense so they can communicate with the experts. So I'm excited to see both on the high end, sort of how like, you know, I don't know, Marvel with the treasure trove of visual umami at their disposal and triple A talent, like how is that gonna raise the ceiling altogether? But at the same time, like what are indies gonna be able to do, right? So I think like we have to lean into this and figuring out a path to coexist with this technology would be a better one than trying to push back on it. Finding a path to coexist with this technology is a fantastic place to end and we are out of time. Thank you everybody for listening. Thanks to Production Summit. And uh, we'll be around if you have any questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So in this room, we're having editing Marvel.